when you Google Sam Bankman Freed and effective altruism, you get headlines back like, how effective altruism let Sam Bankman Freed happen? Effective altruism is as bankrupt as Sam Bankman Freed's FTX. Effective altruist leaders were repeatedly warned about Sam Bankman Freed years before FTX collapsed, and Sam Bankman Freed and the effective altruism delusion. It sounds fairly damning, and in the fallout after the FTX scandal and Bankman Freed's arrest, effective altruism itself seemed to be on trial along with him. Now, when you Google Sam Bankman Freed and Polycule, you get back partner swapping, pills, and playing games inside Sam Bankman Freed's FTX party house, polyamory, penthouses, and plenty of loans inside the crazy world of FTX. And FTX's crypto empire was reportedly run by a bunch of roommates in the Bahamas who dated each other, according to the news site that helped trigger the company's sudden collapse. What the hell exactly is going on? Kayla... It was really hard for me to not reply to anything that you were – you were like, okay, I'm going to do the intro snippet now. I'm going to do the cold open now. And I was like, okay. And then you started doing it, and I was like, how am I supposed to not fucking respond to any of this? <laughs> well, respond now. I had to, like, point my mouth away from the microphone because I started giggling when you brought up the the polycule roommates, Bahamas. I mean, it sounds pretty fun. It really does, honestly. Um. I, 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 where to begin? We, you know what? We're going to get into it, so you'll you'll have plenty of time to respond. You should know where to begin because you did the research. I did. Welcome back to Culture Just Weird. I'm Kayla. I'm a TV writer and a goddamn expert on effective altruism after all of these episodes. Not really, but it sounds good to say. I'm Chris. I am a data scientist slash game designer. I have never been to the Bahamas with a polycule to cause a major financial collapse before, but I... You know, I'm looking if anybody else wants to join me. Uh, I already said welcome back to Culture Just Weird, but I'm going to say it again. Thank you for supporting the show by listening to it and coming back and hearing us yap week after week. If you'd like to support us further, you can go to patreon.com slash culture just weird. And if you want to yap with us about cults and weirds, you can find us on Discord linked in our show notes. Last week on the show, we tackled effective altruism and long-termism, the last two letters of the test grail bundle. It was a bit of a primer, allowing us to dip our toes into what exactly these concepts are. In short, effective altruism, or EA, equals using evidence and reason to figure out how to benefit others as much as possible and taking action on that basis, usually with like charitable donations. And long-termism means extrapolating that idea out to include considerations of the far future and the humans who might live then. And that's why you'd be in a polycule, so you can make as many babies as possible. A lot of cross-pollination going on. That's not not a thing. I don't think think this polycule was, (laughs) um, I don't think this polycule had anything to do with Pop, like population stuff, but like that's why Elon Musk has twelve kids or however many. Should we explain polycule? Like, well, the... we'll get to it. Don't worry. Okay, okay. <laughs> we could explain it later. <laughs> I want. I want to keep our listeners on our, on their toes on the, on bated breath for a moment. Don't forget, my mom still listens to this. So. She'll enjoy this episode. <laughs> this week, we're going to get into some of the criticisms of effective altruism and long termism, and some of the criticisms. It's not really possible to be totally uh, comprehensive on this because it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. In short, we are all now here for the good stuff. Yeah. So what the juicy episode, (laughs) the juicy episode. So what the hell happened with infamous effective altruist and alleged polycule enthusiast, Sam Bankman Freed. I would like to say up front that we at Culture Just Weird are pro polyamory for consenting parties. Hell yeah. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Probably a good thing that more people are learning about this relationship structure. That said, we really want to talk about those polycule headlines because, boy, did they scandalize the news media for a while in 2022. I feel like we run into this, like, frequently where it's, like, there's stuff that we genuinely are supporting and in favor of. But, like, somehow it's still – we still have this, like, vestige of, like, societal whatever shame or something that, like, makes it fun to, like, gossip scandalize about. Yeah. You know? We're hypocrites. Yeah, we're hypocrites. I feel like we run into that more than once. Yeah, that's that's why we have a podcast. That's right. (laughs) 
Okay, so Sam Bankman Fried, I will refer to him as many others do as SBF, founded a cryptocurrency exchange called FTX, because we're going to get a lot of acronyms mm-hmm, in. Mm-hmm, Test Grill, yep. Yeah. He courted a ton of investors, made a boatload of money for himself. Like, I think he ranked 41st in Forbes' list of richest Americans at Holy one point. Holy shit, he got a, that high? Oh, yes. He, yes, yes. That dude? That dude. Like, what am I doing with my life? This is like a like a a Mark Zuckerberg 2.0. Like he very much like leaned into the aesthetic of like my hair is unkempt and I wear t-shirts and flip flops. That uh, guy. Oh my god. Okay. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, there's a lot wrong with it, but in November 2022, FTX went bankrupt really badly, and the following month, SBF was arrested and indicted on charges of wire fraud, commodities fraud, securities fraud, money laundering, and campaign finance law violations. That's a lot of fraud. Oh, yeah. He was convicted on seven counts, sentenced to 25 years in prison, and everyone invested in FTX lost their money. Before shit hit the fan... He helped popularize the concept of effective altruism in the mainstream as he was a big EA guy. Great. Good. We are all caught up. But what about the polycule? (laughs) Okay. Get get to that. (laughs) So the story goes that in 2021, SBF and the whole FTX crew moved the operation from Hong Kong to the Bahamas, allegedly because there were like fewer regulations there for like financial stuff. Yeah, I think that's that tracks with what I know about the Caribbean. 10 members of an inner circle, essentially like the execs of FTX, lived together in like a palatial mansion, like just Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the most succession-y, most like Silicon Mm. Valley-y Bahamas mansion you can imagine. Sorry, why isn't there a TV show yet? (sighs) There, Oh, there will be. You better believe there will be. Okay. While running, quote unquote, the cryptocurrency exchange, they also partied hard. Obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The stories go that SBF and his roommates would like stay up all night and take amphetamines like speed. Mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. himself once tweeted, quote, stimulants when you wake up, sleeping pills if you need them when you sleep. <laughs> like that was the tweet. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I drink coffee in the morning and sometimes yeah. I smoke weed at night. So I I can't really make fun of him too much. A lot of time was also spent watching SBF play video games. Like it's confirmed that he was literally playing League of Legends during at least one very important fundraising call with Sequoia Capital. All right. So here's where also, I would, he was bad. <laughs> I would, oh, oh, he was like a baddie. They he found was, his ranking and he was not good at it. Wood League. Um, I would love to make fun of him for playing LOL. And, and I would love to equate the like toxic nature of these types sure. of games with like him being a douchebag. But also, I have a bunch of friends that work at Riot, so I feel like I shouldn't do that. But also, anyone who plays video games is bad and wrong. That's right. That's, That's right. the position yes. of the show. Yes. Of course, the rumors go that all 10 of the co-ed inner circle group were all dating each other, either like pairing up and then mixing and matching in either like an on again, off again situationship or like something akin to swinging. Okay, or they so... were like doing straight up polyamory. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's unclear whether they were like all cuddle puddling in like one every single night all 10 of them or whether it was like some like amorphous like amoebic sort of like something would break off and then they would come back in and it It was like an incestuous pile awesome and to be clear um polyamory is a relationship structure in which multiple people rather than just a couple form a romantic unit so like multiple people all dating each other in a single relationship do we know the ratio of these 10 people? You know, that's a good question. I don't. But we do know that Caroline Ellison, CEO, not related to Larry Ellison as far as I know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I just, you're saying tech people and then Ellison. I'm just assuming it's Larry Ellison. Not related to Larry Ellison. Huh. Different Ellison. Uh, she was the CEO of a trading firm fun- founded by FTX. And she was also SBF's, (laughs) there's too many acronyms. She was also Bankman Freed's sometimes girlfriend. SBF's GF. Correct. Um, She also blogged about polyamory on Tumblr and like her journey into it. Oh, she did. You know, I remember her in the sort of like fallout news of FTX. Like she she also got quite a bit of heat. Part of the maelstrom. My favorite quote from her Tumblr that I found was this. There's problems here. <laughs> and if you are a polyamorous person, you will be able to identify them immediately. And if you are not a polyamorous person, I think they'll still like scream right in your ear. <laughs> okay. Quote, when I first started my foray into poly, I thought of it as a radical break from my trad past. But TBH, 
acronyms. I've come to decide the only acceptable style of Polly is best characterized as something like Imperial Chinese Harem. None of this non-hierarchical bullshit. Everyone should have a ranking of their partners. People should know where they fall on that ranking. And there should be vicious power struggles for the higher ranks. Um, that sounds awesome. I cannot confirm or deny whether watch, this is like a joke or reality. <laughs> it, it definitely falls in that like troll not a troll realm. But like. Yeah, it does. Um, I don't. I have some thoughts. Like, if you treat it like a sport, that sounds awesome. <laughs> you know, if it's, like, not, like, a serious, like, you know, if you're, like, well, I'm I'm just, I'm just going to play the sport of polyamory and not take right, it seriously. Right. That sounds like that could be fun. But, uh, yeah. I mean, from my limited understanding of, like, ethical polyamory practices, this is um, perhaps not the most no. sound way to pursue a poly relationship. I don't think that relationships should be about, like, vicious power struggles and rankings that's my personal then how do you get a game of thrones kayla <laughs> well i mean they didn't even have time to get their game of thrones on because they all got arrested oh, yeah, or whatever that's true but why bring any of this up like what does bankman freed's alleged polycule have to do with ea Good effective question. altruism doesn't this kind of just seem like we were talking about like scandalized sensationalized reporting to like make these tech bros look like weirdos to pearl clutching guardian readers yeah, isn't that what we're doing? Yeah. I mean, I think Scott Alexander points out in his essay in Continued Defense of Effective Altruism, which we talked about last week. Right, the rationalist guy. Correct. Yeah. He says, quote, nobody cares about preventing pandemics. Everyone cares about whether SBF was in a polycule or not. Effective altruists will only intersect with the parts of the world that other people care about when we screw up. Therefore, everyone will think of us as those guys who are constantly screwing up and maybe doing other things I'm forgetting right now. In short, he's saying that like for every well, article, I know, yeah, for every article that S about SBF's polycule, there are a dozen articles that should have been written about the pro self-proclaimed two hundred thousand lives Alexander's um, estimated Alexander estimates effective altruism has saved. I guess he has a point about sensationalism in media and click That's why I play, brought this click up. baiting. That's why I brought this up in this episode and not in the previous episode because yeah. I read that quote and I was like, oh, yeah, let's talk about the maybe the good stuff first. So I'm not just like, you're not being ooh. one of those. Yeah, yeah. But I still want to do ooh a little bit. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Damn it, Kayla. Frankly, however, to go back on myself. Yeah. Oh, okay. I bring it up because it is relevant. Like, especially when we're getting into the criticism section of, of effective altruism. Like, if a movement is going to support and even encourage tech billionaires to acquire as much wealth and power as they can so they can you know, donate it to causes of their choice, we also have to look at, like, the whole package of the person we're allowing to acquire said wealth and power. I think that's actually a really good point. You, you, I, thank you. No, you're bringing me back around now because you're right. Like, a big part of... Not to... And, and, and to not to say that polyamory is like unethical i'm just saying that up front sorry continue no, no no the the point is not that polyamory is unethical it's perfectly ethical if it's consensual and you know whatever like anything else um it's more that like yeah maybe there is a reason to interrogate deeply into the lives of people who we have allowed to ac accumulate such wealth because effectively accumulating that wealth is equivalent to saying we are giving this person a lot of decision-making power over how resources are spent and what things are built. Right. And if these guys are using those resources to build yachts instead of building bridges or shelters for homeless people, I think that we need to be saying like, okay, well, what are they, what are they doing? Like, what would you say you do? What would here? you say you do here? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's really possible to disentangle one's lived ethics with one's charitable ethics, especially when we're talking about, like you said, people who are hoarding billions of dollars. Yeah, not at that level of wealth. Right, right. But again, there's nothing wrong with polyamory and there's nothing even wrong with like taking drugs or playing video games or like fucking off to the Bahamas or whatever. These aren't That's the lucky, ethical issues. That's <laughs> But when, but when Caroline Ellison is helping make her boyfriend violently wealthy and then blogging that – this is another quote – blogging that her ideal man can, quote, control most major world governments and has sufficient strength to physically overpower you. Oh, OK. Hold on. Hold I'm going to look at that twice. OK. So – so she's she's bragging about how her boyfriend can. No, she's saying this is her ideal man. She's not saying oh, her this, ideal is, man. this is my ideal okay. man, which, I mean, she is – has has and has continued to date SBF during this period. 
Well, that's he, he did. He became not that guy for sure. I mean, it sounds like he never was that guy, but like after FTX collapse, like I don't it, think he's the ideal anymore. But I think that he was certainly on his way at one time. Right. When okay. you're ranked 41st richest American, he didn't look like he could physically overpower it anyone well i don't know maybe she was like four foot eleven i don't know <laughs> oh physically overpower her she's talking about the ideal man is for her is somebody who can physically overpower herself oh i thought she was doing like uh my boyfriend can beat your boyfriend up thing that, you know what that could be an interpretation <laughs> but my interpretation she's saying that like i am okay i am deeply aroused by by a man who has extreme global power and can also physically overpower me. Okay. I find that erotic. Got it. Well, you know, like to each their own. To each their own. But <laughs> I don't think that we should be giving a lot of money to people who are eroticizing and idealizing mm-hmm. in reality right. individual Silicon Valley tech bros to be able to control major world governments. That's like... I know that this is probably some Tumblr roleplay fanfic bullshit, and also it's kind of what was actually happening. Right. Troll, not a troll. And another thing I'm going to look at, re the like polyamory situation, is that sometimes shitty people use polyamory as a cover for shitty abusive behavior in relationships. And the EA community has been accused of exactly that, even outside of the Sam Bakeman freed stuff. Both Bloomberg and Time reported on women accusing the EA community, particularly the Silicon Valley EA community, of cultivating a culture in which predatory sexual behavior thrived. Because, of course. Yeah, this is – now we're talking about, like, classic cult stuff here, right? Yeah. This is, like, Source Family or Nexium or any number of others. Men within the movement were accused of using their power to groom younger women and utilized the guise of polyamory to do so. The accusers also stated that EA was – largely male dominated in the community and sexual misconduct was either excused or ignored. The Center for Effective Altruism, which is William McCaskill's uh, organization, argued to time that they had banned accused perpetrators from the organization and offered to investigate new claims. They also said it's hard to figure out whether the sexual misconduct that went on was unique to the EA community or whether it was just good old fashioned societal misogyny. I don't disagree with that. Like that's, I mean, you see a lot, you see misogyny get its own flavor no matter where it is. Like, in fact, I was even going to say, like, yeah, polyamory can be used as a cover for certain types of abuse. Like, so can just regular old monogamy. Sure. Yeah. Like, the the individual family unit is is used as a bludgeon by a lot of people to, to advance political agendas. I hope that they're then donating some money to the structural issues behind societal misogyny that might be taking down their very organization. But Ah, I don't think that they are. Oh. We'll get to that. (laughs) I don't know. I I agree with you. And also that that response rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. I don't think it's wrong to acknowledge that, like, these problems grow out of systems, not simply some Mm -hmm. effect of altruism itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also it feels a little bit like a cop out and a little bit like washing your hands, a lack of understanding of how like you are currently shaping culture and you're continuing to shape culture in the image of like the shitty stuff. Yeah. It's hard to tell, especially with these billionaire guys, because so many of them seem like we can't do anything, pass it on. But like, they're also (laughs) creating culture. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. Regarding SBF specifically, there is some question about whether he was quote unquote, really an effective altruist. And I think those questions kind of expose a deep criticism of EA. It is extremely easy to bastardize the original concept and use it for personal gain that ends up hurting a lot of people. SBF publicly declared himself an ea -er, stated that he was, quote, earning to give, and made donations, quote, not based on personal interest, but on the projects that are proven by data to be the most effective at helping people. He was a member of Giving What We Can, the organization we talked about last week, where mm-hmm. members pledged to donate at least 10% of their incomes to EA causes. He founded something called Future Fund, which was supposed to donate money to nonprofits. And guess who was on the team? Elias Yudkowsky. William McCaskill. Oh, okay. That one of the sense. founders of the EA movement. And it wasn't the only way McCaskill was connected to SBF. Like, I read somewhere that at one point, as Sam Bigman fried had, like, worked at the Center for Effective Altruism. I'm not sure if that's true. Um... But in 2022, when Elon Musk was looking to fund his Twitter purchase, 
William McCaskill acted as a liaison between Musk and Sam Bankman Fried. McCaskill reached out to Mm. Musk, who had once described McCaskill's book, What We Owe the Future, as a, quote, close match for my philosophy. Right. That quote comes up like everywhere. That quote has been plastered across the internet by now. Yeah. And McCaskill said, hey, my collaborator, and yes, he used the phrase, my collaborator, Mm. can maybe help secure this funding. And then, you know, ultimately, of course, that did not go through because Sam Bankman Fried got arrested and right. went to jail. Yeah, getting arrested would make that – would put a damper on that. You know, I, um, I'm i picturing now – because you were saying like, oh, there's other ways that they were tied together. And now I'm picturing there's like like a Fives League of Legends team that's like <laughs> – and it's like Sam Bankman Fried, McCaskill, Musk, Yudkowsky, and I don't know, pick another fifth uh, Bostrom or something. Yeah. And they're like they're all playing League of Legends. And I'm like trying to figure out like – like who would go where, you know, because there's like very friends, specific roles. But they're also all enemies. Yeah, of course. And they're like yelling at each other like, dude, you should have been there for the gank, man. <laughs> oh, kill me. <laughs> Leading up to his arrest, uh, Bankman Freed did an interview with Vox reporter Kelsey Piper via Twitter DM, which I can't tell if it's really smart or really dumb. He stated that his, quote, ethics stuff was, quote, mostly a front. And that ethics is a, quote, <laughs> dumb game we woke Westerners play where we say all the right shibboleths and so everyone likes us, end quote. Ooh, dropping the shibboleth yeah. word. Many. Should we define that? <laughs> uh, can you? It's like it's like a, a word. <laughs> it, I, no, I can't. It's a word that is used to define in-groups and out-groups. Yeah, yeah. So, like, if you know the word, then you're on the in. And if you don't know the word, then you're identified as an outsider. It's like how we talk about jargon being... Part of the ritual yes. criteria. Yeah, yeah, he could. Yeah. Many, of course, took this statement to mean that he was using EA as a cover for his shady dealings and his accrual of wealth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He later claimed he was referring to like things like greenwashing and not EA efforts, but like mm. damage kind of done. Right. Okay. McCaskill has since expressed deep regret at being duped by SBF. For what it's worth. So did they break up their League of Legends team? I think they did. Oh, no. Well, I don't think you can play LOL in jail. Shit, SBF needs another support. Oh, yeah, now he's just going to get like, (laughs) you know, like neo-Nazi Steve from his his cellmate is going to have to be his playing partner. Unfortunately, neo-Nazi Steve is probably not that far from a regular LOL player. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Zing. Sorry, Riot friends. (laughs) I don't know anything about LOL. I just wanted to make a burn. (laughs) Make a burn. For what it's worth... As I mentioned before the intro music, Time reports that McCaskill and other EA leaders were actively warned about SBF being a fraud, being a deceiver very early on, like 2018. And those warnings were essentially ignored. Like McCaskill was literally with this guy till the end. Hmm. When he, when he, uh, when the whole FTX thing went down, did McCaskill play it like, I had no idea. Or was he more like, well, I was warned, but you know. I think he played it more as like, I'm outraged at how like duped I was. I'm outraged at the harm that this guy has caused. I don't think he said like, I should have known better. I could be wrong. Yeah. He definitely tweeted about this. So like, it's free to go and like look at and kind of see how you feel about it. But there was a lot of expression of like, I'm outraged that this guy did this. Yeah, I'll, I'll give him a couple empathy points here because like, I, I do understand that like, when you have a cause that you think is really important and you have a hose of money feeding that cause, right. there's going to be a lot of sunk cost fallacy of like, no, 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 no. This guy has to be fine because if he's not fine, then I'm fucked. Yeah, that's and that's a really good point. Like McCaskill has all these organizations, but like he himself is not an FTX tech bro. He himself is not Elon Musk. He himself is not mm-hmm. generating billions and billions and billions of, of dollars of wealth. Yeah. So there's a lot of motivation for him to dismiss warnings. Yeah. And like none of us are perfect, but I think you got to be more perfect when you're doing stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. There's a higher standard when you're when you're in command of that many resources. Let's actually continue this conversation about McCaskill. Like, obviously, we talked about him in last week's episode, but I kind of held off on saying how I felt about him. And part of that was because I wanted people to come and listen to this episode. But <laughs> another part of it is that I feel really complicated about it. I, mm. I, I don't think he's a villain. I do think he's demonstrably naive or has been demonstrably naive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think he's in a really unfortunate position right now. Yeah. 
Academic and researcher Gwilym David Blunt, whose area of focus is, among other things, the ethics of philanthropy, wrote an article for The Philosopher titled Effective Altruism, Long-Termism, and the Problem of Arbitrary Power, which you sent to me. So thank you for finding that. Wait, his last name was Blunt? Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> In this essay, he explains, ha ha, that was me laughing at you. Thanks. Thanks for, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the support. In the essay, he explains that there is an atmosphere of schadenfreude surrounding McCaskill now, particular, particularly in the wake of FTX's spectacular fall, largely coming from other philosophers and academics. And I think I would also argue the media. Mm hmm. Blunt explains that part of this might be related to McCaskill's success in doing one of the more difficult things in academia breaking out of it and having a direct and recognized impact on the wider world. Mm -hmm. mm, right. Blunt, Blunt rightfully credits McCaskill with creating both the effective altruist and long-termist movements and states that his Center for Effective Altruism has, quote, annual expenditures approaching $400 million with about $46 billion more in funding commitments. That's a, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of impact, baby. That's like a Scrooge McDuck swim in your little gold coins amount of money. Blunt goes on to describe how in 2022... McCaskill expressed concern about a deep change in the overall vibe of effective altruism. What he originally imagined and embodied as a practice of ascetic frugality had now become a way for the very wealthy to wield more wealth. In short, his own philosophy in breaking through to wider culture had also gotten away from him and its original roots. It's interesting that he felt that switch because I don't, I didn't feel it in time, but I definitely feel it in space yeah. with this where I, I feel like there's, kind of i don't know there's two different kinds of <laughs> effective yeah. altruists right there's yes. like the people that like to do some math and figure out where to donate you know their ten thousand dollars or five thousand dollars and then there's like this sam bankman freed set of like crazy wealthy billionaires that are like you know using it again as like a club i think that it's probably they they were able to tap into a Ooh, if I tell people that if they invest in me, they're not just investing in me, they're investing in the future and they're mm -hmm. investing in these good causes, right. I get more money. Right. And, right. and especially people are going to take days, advantage like, of that. People, are, uh, you know, compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago, people are much more interested in investing in things that are more, you know, activist investing, right? right? Things right. that are more. I hate that phrase. I know. I hate that phrase too. But you're, people are more likely today to invest in something that feels like it's doing something for the you know capital G good. Right. So in this way, I, I feel for William McCaskill because like that's tough. If you come up with this idea and you have this like uh, – monkish is not the greatest word, but like it's supposed to be – it was originally supposed to be more frugal, more ascetic or is the word that is used, more austere versus like – big and ostentations and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. This article, it kind of softened my heart towards him a little bit, which is good. And like, I think McCaskill was 24 years old when he developed the idea of effective altruism. Oh, he's a little baby boy. And like 24 year olds are of course well into adulthood. And McCaskill was deeply educated in philosophy among other things. And still 24 year olds, like while they have many gifts of youth that we lose in older age, 24-year-olds also often lack wisdom that does come with age. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is some wisdom lacking around his approach to his own philosophy. Like, it's worth talking about how he was unable to see some of this coming, that he couldn't look at history and recent events and think, hmm, wealthy people usually act in their own self-interest and often resort to unethical means to accrue wealth. It's worth talking about how, like, despite being warned about SBF and his shady practices, McCaskill was still duped along with the rest of the FTX investors and had to like take to Twitter to express his rage and embarrassment over the whole thing. Mm. So were the warnings like, I mean, if somebody had said, hey, this dude's sus, no cap, skibbity, do you think that that would have gotten through to him? I think he would have been like, what the hell are you talking about? Oh, it's 2018. No, oh, he was 24 in 2018. Okay, so he's yeah. a millennial. So he's, he's, I think he's 37 now. He's, no, he's no, he a, wasn't 24 in 2018. He was 24 when he came up with these ideas. Okay. When he founded, like, giving what we can in those things. So he's more, but he's more of a millennial. Than, yeah, he's, yeah. yeah, I think he's my age. Okay, so, oh, okay, okay. So he's, like, right smack in the middle of millennial. Okay, so you'd have yeah. to be like, hey, man, this SBF guy is chuggy. Chewy was a Gen Z term, baby. Oh, that was a Gen Z term that against like, millennials. Yeah. Right. I don't know. What you don't, was even, our you don't even remember don't even millennial jargon from 15 years ago or whatever. Uh, 
He said, Harry I Potter? can have effective <laughs> altruism. SBF is like Draco Malfoy. Yeah, that would have gotten through okay, him. Okay, okay. It's also worth talking about how when Effective Ventures Foundations, a coalition of EA organizations, including the Center for Effective Altruism, Giving What We Can and 80,000 Hours, all of which McCaskill is involved in, when Effective Ventures Foundations bought Witham Abbey, a literal manor house on 25 acres of land for 17 million pounds to use as their new headquarters. And McCaskill does not really seem to see the problem there. Yeah, I mean, the optics there aren't great. He does say that, well, he used the word ascetic, he used the word monk. But if you're going to yeah. get a, you know, if you're going to be monkish, get an abbey. It's, I guess that's true, yeah. You know? Like, you should go look up pictures of it. It's like... A palatial you abbey. Know, it's not Versailles, but it's... <laughs> It's a fucking Abbey, man. Yeah. And like, it does just bring up the question of why is an effective altruist group that is like, put your money where your mouth is. Why are they spending 17 million pounds on a mansion when the whole mission of the movement is to like spend the most money where it can do the most effective material good? Yeah. And you know what? I, I've heard the argument. I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but I've heard the argument about like, well, it's, you know, the, the. We it's can for do the show. best work. Oh, yeah. it's for show. Well, it's and it's it's for show and for influence. So like if yeah, and we can do the best work, right? Like we can work better here. Uh, people will take us more seriously. Blah blah blah. All the you know the the sort of like aesthetic things that maybe it brings to the table, and then that has a positive ROI. So it's actually good. Don't really buy it. I just don't buy it anymore because I feel like if you if your thing is effective altruism, if your thing is like ascetic, you know, high ROI giving, then wouldn't you be better off advertising yourself as being like, yeah, man, we work out of a warehouse. Like that's yeah. much more to me is much more effective. Like I, there was, I forget who the, this is like long, the, the knowledge of this is long lost to me, but in business school, I remember hearing a story about like some CEO that was a CEO of this company that was, and they would, whatever it was, like they, they cut, they were like very conscious about costs and they're like, they were like, Hey, we need to, you know, do things cheaply so we can give it, you know, pass on the savings to the customer, whatever it was. They wanted to be really cognizant about costs. And so this guy like sat on some, like, like his desk was like some like busted ass table in like an, it wasn't a corner office and right. it was like, he was sitting on like milk crates or something like insane like that. And, but, and it was like, he, you know, he could have spent $10 to get a decent chair, but like it was for show. It was for like, right. Hey, I'm sitting on milk crates. So like, that's the attitude I want you guys to take. And I feel like that also could apply here. If SBF figured out he could get more money by not getting haircuts and wearing flip flops, then like, I feel like that, yeah. that could maybe translate. I, right. I don't know business, but it's just, and also I still just like, don't buy an Abbey. Yeah. There's other options between milk crates and Abbey. Right, right. But like, it's just, it's not like it's, it's fine and all, I guess, if you're, you're again going for the, the show of it, but don't you want to show your DNA and not like what you're not about? That's I don't what know. I think. Blunt goes on to explain that McCaskill and others have failed to include, quote, a working theory of power, mm. which results in major blind spots and loopholes in the EA framework. I think that sentence there is like why I was like, oh, you got to read this yeah. because I think that's the, the sort of the key insight. There seems to be little or no understanding of the fact that the harm caused by billionaires leveraging a system that allows them to become billionaires enough to embrace EA ideals cannot then be outweighed by the good they might do in their EA endeavors. Okay, maybe it's that sentence, actually. That was my sentence. <laughs> oh, that was your Summarizing sentence. Summarizing what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I think that that's... That's just another thing that's so, and that and that particular insight I think even goes beyond just EA, but like to you know to altruism in general, to right. to charity in general, because that's you know a lot of these starting starting with like the Carnegies and the Rockefellers, that's what they like to do. Yep. But you no, know, why are they in a position to be doing that in the first place? Do they want to interrogate that? Not really. I still don't understand why Bill Gates keeps going. I'm just donating all donating all my money to charity, and then he gets richer and richer and richer. Yeah, I don't understand. But God forbid <laughs> we get taxed. EA founders like McCaskill and Peter Singer seem hell bent on viewing someone like SBF as like a bad apple, an outlier, like an unfortunate one off. He's not the result of a flaw in the philosophy, even though the philosophy facilitated his rise to money and power, which facilitated his harmful behavior. <laughs> without a working theory of power, without grappling with structural power and what it means, EA and long termism helps put power in the hands of the ultra wealthy and then keep it there. 
which is do I need to say why that's a problem? <laughs> No, I think we've got, we've we've said it but like three or four times in this episode. They they get to make all the resource decisions right. if that happens. That's not great. EA and long termism look around and say like, "Hey, let's put our money where over here where the people need help." But they do not look around and say like, "Hey, what are the structures in place that cause those people to need help in the first place, and how do we change that?" Right. Because those causes are so often necessary in generating the kind of wealth disparity that we're talking about, and so. If you if you buy into the idea, which I do, that billionaires only exist when massive amounts of people live in poverty, it's easy for those billionaires to go, hey, I'll donate some of my wealth rather than like aid in the dismantling of the structures that allowed them to become so rich and powerful. Right. It's an indictment on the whole system. I feel indicted. EA seems unable to grapple with the fact that there are structural issues within their own philosophical framework and movement. And part of that is because the philosophy seems to avoid grappling with the very concept of structural issues. And like you said, this is a problem that comes up in the ethics of philanthropy and charity time and time again. Like this is not reinventing the wheel. This, this, this problem is time immemorial. Right. And they're not fixing it. No. Cause these people want to have their names on their college buildings. It's very important. I will also note, again, that it's funny to me that the Center for Effective Altruism was like, hmm, maybe the issues with sexual misconduct in our ranks was actually the result of systemic misogyny when they don't really seem equipped to talk about or engage in systemic issues elsewhere. Just yeah, the, that's, just a, a that's a little like, mm, have your cake and eat it too. McCaskill and SBF and these guys aren't the only place to look for these criticisms of EA and long-termism's effect on empowering the mega wealthy with both like a lot of money and a lot of material power. Um, Professor Gary Marcus, who is a researcher focused on the intersection of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and AI, which is very cool, recently wrote an article titled, Open AI's Sam Altman is becoming one of the most powerful people on Earth. We should be very afraid. Great. And I am. Done. Yeah. <laughs> so Sam Altman, another Sam, it's just Sam, Sam problem Fucking all the way Sam's. down. Yeah. Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI, the company behind the ubiquitous chat GPT. And he's kind of recently become the poster child for like the Silicon Valley AI movement. And mm -hmm. he definitely has that like Mark Zuckerberg, like, I'm just a regular guy and I'm just doing this because I really like it. And Just a regular guy having people take pictures of me wakeboarding <laughs> on the 4th of July. Gary Marcus goes on to describe how Sam Altman uses both deceit to build an image, like he lies about owning no stock in open AI when he owns stock in companies that own stock in open AI. He's mm -hmm. just like put layers. Wait, so he says, he says I don't own stock in open AI, yes. but then he own he has an ownership stake in Y in Combinator. And Y Combinator and Y Combinator owns stock in open AI. <laughs> Okay, so he's just he's just straight up lying. Yeah. Okay. And it's not like he doesn't know because he was like I don't know if he currently is, but he was at one time the president of Y Combinator. So he knows. That's it's like not a, that's yeah. like me saying like, well, I don't own XYZ stock even though like it's part of a mutual fund that I own. Yeah, yes I do. Yes, you do. He lies about being pro AI regulation while actively working against it. He lies about whether or not a certain famous actress voiced his chat GPT program, oh, even yeah. when that certain actress said, don't fucking use my voice. And then he tweeted her when he tweeted the chat GPT voice, which is the name of a movie that Scarlett Johansson was in. And it sounded exactly like Scarlett Johansson's voice, even though she said, don't use my voice. Yeah. And then she sued. Yeah. Which she should have. Of course. Saying like at, at no point in that process did she say maybe. No. Yeah. No, he was he was moving fast and breaking things and. You shouldn't do that. Ex-employees of OpenAI have been forced to agree to not talk badly about the company. Like, like uh, I forget exactly what it was, but they were coerced into like signing contracts that said like they would lose all their stock options or something if that they talked badly sound about the legal. I think they've had to. I think OpenAI had to be like, oh, sorry, I guess we won't do that. Okay, I guess that's good at least. Sam Altman's been recruited by Homeland Security to join their AI safety and security board. I do not know whether he actually has, but I know that like they've tried to recruit him okay. while actively working to dismantle AI safety in his own company. Mm -hmm. And he's made a shit ton of money doing all this. Even though he's like one of those guys that's like, I don't take salary. I don't have stock. Yes, you do. 
I thought OpenAI was just like losing money, like burning piles of cash hand over fist. I don't know how anything works because it seems like that's how every company these <laughs> yeah. days in Silicon Valley is. It's no, like, you're right. Ah, they're losing all this money while the CEO and like the execs become fabulously wealthy somehow. Yeah. I, yeah. I also don't really know how, how is that Elon works. Musk so rich when like half of his companies are constantly losing money? I, I I feel like this is an important question to answer, and I don't quite have the answer to it. But it was like when we were watching Succession, it was like, it didn't phase me at all that there was like this whole plot line of like, oh my God, Waystar Royco is like, <laughs> owes bajillions, yeah. and like we're way in the red, that. way in the red, and yet all the Roys were just like on yachts and yep. private jets. Yep. Like, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I don't really understand how this person is less solvent than I am, but they're the one on the yacht. I don't really get it, but that does track. <sighs> yeah, it does. There's there's a lot more to the Sam Altman story. Um, we'll link the article in the show notes so you can read further because it is it is an article that it's and it's not an anti AI article. This this Gary Marcus fellow is a pro AI guy. Read the article, see what you think, but just know that Sam Altman is another self-proclaimed effective altruism guy. Yeah, of course he is. And there's no safeguards in place keeping this guy from fucking everything up with his quest to move fast and break things, deregulate and de-safetyify AI so he can either make his company rich or himself rich or at least become very powerful. Even if he doesn't have any money, this is a powerful man. He's being recruited by Homeland Security. Right, right. There's two more things I want to talk about before we wrap up. First, last week I said I'd explain the difference between EA and utilitarianism. It didn't really fit anywhere, so I'll just say it here. Oh, yeah, because we said it was kind of like, it kind of feels like a modern iteration of yeah. utilitarianism. Luckily, Wikipedia has a section on exactly this. Oh, perfect. It states that EA, quote, does not claim that the good is the sum total of well-being and that EA and that, quote, EA does not claim that people should always maximize the good regardless of the means. It goes on to explain that Toby okay. Ord, okay. one of the original philosophers behind EA, quote, described utilitarians as number crunching compared with effective altruists who are guided by conventional wisdom tempered by an eye on the numbers. So they're the same, but different. It's their different okay. flavors. <laughs> okay. Okay. I I think I understand. I'm going to have to give that more thought, but I, thank you for the disambiguation. I think the effect of altruists try to paint the utilitarians as like, they just look at the numbers and nothing else matters, which like maybe some do, maybe some don't. And effective altruists look at the numbers, but they also consider other things. And I kind of think that. Okay. So what you're telling I think me. There's a bit of an overlap. <laughs> is that utilitarians are pro moat or no pro torture and the EAs are pro moat. Probably. Okay. You got to ask them. Lastly, I wanted to talk about community. And sorry if I'm getting on a soapbox here, because it's something that's been Kayla, like... Kayla, this, this is a whole, podcast. I know. This whole episode has been a little soapboxy. <laughs> I was like, here's the criticism, and they're all mine. Um, this is something that's been rolling around in my head ever since we started talking about these episodes and, and this topic. I think one of my personal criticisms of EA and long-termism is that it seems to remove like a sense of community building and mutual aid from the idea of like philanthropy or helping. And I don't think, again, I don't think it's wrong for McCaskill to argue that it's better if you have a hundred dollars to use that money to help a hundred people living in an impoverished area across the world from you rather than helping 10 people living next door to you. There's certainly an argument there. I don't think that's wrong. I think it's good to think about the global community and consider where we can help and who matters in this world. But I also think that philosophically diminishing the help you can do in your own community as ethically inferior has its own downsides. Like, I think that people like McCaskill and the Elon Musks and the various Sams of the EA world, they feel very cut off from people like you and me. Mm -hmm. I think the wealthier you get, the more cut off from quote unquote regular society you become to the point where you can only relate to other extremely wealthy people and you live in this like really hard edged bubble that cannot be penetrated, haha. -ha. The the world becomes like a series of unfortunately calculations and hypotheticals, like hypotheticals you're detached from. And that's really like the opposite of community. You do not live with the people who are your neighbors. Yeah. I, man, yeah, I, I also am of two minds on this. Like, I, you're right. Like, it's it's good to, to widen 
the scope of who you think of as your neighbor and who you are willing to give charity to and, and consider the, the global community and all of humanity, that all sounds nice. But on the other side, there's the yeah contribution to like the atomization of society. Right. And, you know, if we're all just doing, you know, the math, which is, seems to be what they complain about utilitarians. But anyway, if we're all just doing the math to say, like, we can help the most people in X, Y, Z place, you know, don't worry about physically going down to the, the soup kitchen or whatever, or, you know, even just like, I don't know, baking a pie for your neighbor. Maybe they're still into that, but it just, it feels like it's emphasizing one thing over the other just because of the efficiency and right. the, the effectiveness. That just, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's not the only eroding, measure. Yeah. Eroding the, the community down to the like, like I said, atomization where everything you do has to be mediated through an app and right. you have to, if you're going to swim at a friend's pool, it has to be through Swimply. And if you're going to, you know, get food from a friend, it has to be through Uber and, you know, yada, yada, yada. If you're going to stay at a friend's place, it's got to be through Airbnb. Right. Right. I, I heard a quote during all this research that I lost in one of my like tab closures and I haven't been able to find it again. So no, forgive tab me. tab closures. No. Uh, forgive me for paraphrasing, especially, but Someone pointed out that the Silicon Valley effective altruists literally live in their ivory towers above San Francisco, <laughs> debating and calculating how to get more wealth and what future populations to help with it, while scores of people literally suffer and die in the streets of San Francisco below them. Like literally below them. Yeah. Literally beneath their feet. And that point stuck with me. Like we live in Los Angeles. We live in a city that has a tremendous unhoused population. Like, I think it's 75, it's it's north of 75,000 people. And I think about, that's so many. And, and it's, I think that that's just LA City. I think LA County is more. And so I think about that 200,000 number that Scott Alexander talks about. And I think about if Elon Musk were to take some of his exorbitant wealth and do something to house unhoused people in Los Angeles, if you want to think about it in the long term as stuff, that's not just helping those 75,000 people. That's helping the unhoused people that come after them as well. Right. I don't know why they're not thinking about these things. Like I yeah. think that the destruction of community does have material impact. Well, that, I think that's part of my problem with long-termism is that there's just a lot of like assumption that we are doing the calculations correctly. Right. And I just don't know that you, you can do that. You know, it's like, Oh, well we're definitely spending the money in the right place. Like, are you like uh, you, you have certainty on that. Like you're right, applying right. this certainty of mathematics to something that uh, doesn't feel that certain to me. I'm not saying there isn't a correct answer. I'm just saying that we don't know what it is. Right. And, and you certainly don't know what it is at, you know, your with your EA calculations, or your utilitarian calculations. It's just, yeah, that's one of my problems with it. Essentially it's not morally inferior to help your neighbors. Like our communities are important. And I think that effective altruism and like long-termism divorces the wealthy from that idea. Yeah. I lied. <laughs> There's one more point. Oh my God. You're just like, Sam one Holman. more point. You're like, Sam I Holman. know the long-termist argument. This is, this is, this is a little point. The long-termist argument that future people morally matter just as much, if not more than people literally alive right now is like a super duper sleep, steep, slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And I worry about the anti-abortion argument lurking in that philosophical mire. Like I really worry about that. So yeah, I, it's fundamentally natalist. I, I hope yeah. long-termists at some point grapple with that. Cause, cause yeah, I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about that one. Yeah. You know, and like, I got to say as an economist, I also am kind of annoyed that like, they're not applying a future discount. Yeah. To the morale, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you do that with money. Future money is worth less than current money. That's true. So why aren't you doing that with future people? Like people ten years from now should be like fifty percent of people now, and and so on. You should email Sam Altman uh, and tell him that. See, and but they're like saying, oh, oh we're McCaskill. so objective with all of our math, and like, <laughs> have you even taken an econ one hundred and one class? I think they have, and I think that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline Ellison's father is like an econ professor at MIT. Well, then he should be bringing this up. Uh, you should go email him. I'll email I, him. I'm sure he doesn't have anything else to worry about right now. Okay, I have talked a lot about these guys and about effective altruism and long-termism and everything that goes along with it. And I think it's I think it's finally time. We made our way through the test grill bundle. Like we hit basically every letter on our way down the ladder. So next week on Culture Just Weird. Is Tescreal a cult or is it just weird? Oh, actually, sorry, Kayla. There's one more thing that we need to cover, I think. 
wait, well, it's context. But we did all the test reels. I know we did. We did do all the test reels, and I know that we're like really chomping at the bit at this point. <laughs> I I kind of feel like EA by itself could, could yeah, be its we own criteria. Evaluated. Yeah, we probably could have evaluated that. But I want to talk about a little bit about the context of eugenics. Ooh, behind that that sort of is um not behind is not a good word. It's it's sort of it's sort of like a precursor. But it's it's a complex precursor to all this stuff. Like, and and I don't want to. We'll get to that. That'll be next week's episode. But I, you know, I don't want to give the impression that like, yeah, uh, eugenics, like the the super Nazi part of eugenics, is just everything we've talked about. You're saying it's e tescriol. It's <laughs> it's sort of e tescriol, but tescri- the tescriol bundle has some DNA in the eugenics movement. And I feel like that's important context to bring up before we do the criteria. That's really good because I left out a bunch of stuff from this episode that has to do with um, eugenics adjacent stuff that's related to effective altruism. So perfect. All right. Next time on Culture Just Weird, we're talking about eugenics. Again. (laughs) Again. (laughs) This is Kayla. This is Chris. And this has been... Cult or too much context. Context.